let me introduce our invited speaker for this workshop. So I'm very happy to introduce to you um, our invited speaker, Karl Fristen. Karl Fristen is a theoretical neuroscientist and an outstanding uh, authority in brain imaging. From Wikipedia, it says he has pioneered and developed the single most powerful technique for analyzing the results of brain imaging studies unraveling the patterns of cortical activity and the relationship between uh, cortical areas to one another. Currently, over 90% of papers published in the brain imaging use his methods, which is um, the statistical parametric mapping. And this approach is, is now finding more diverse applications, for example, in the analysis of EEG and MEG data. His method has revolutionized studies of the human brain and given us profound insights into its operation. None, it says on Wikipedia, has had a, ma a major influence as Friston's on the development of brain, human brain studies in the past 25 years. Carl Friston has obtained a never ending list of awards and prizes which I will not reproduce here. So I'd just like to mention that his list of publication has more than 300,000 citations and an age index of 258, according to uh, Google Scholar. That's probably more than all the AMTA participants altogether. <laughs> so his main contribution to theoretical uh, has been a theoretical neurobiology is uh, the free energy principle for action and perception and uh, a mechanism called active inference, which he will talk about today, I suspect. Um, so we are very privileged to, to have Carl Friston here today as our invited speaker and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for coming to us. Oh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I, I should go and look at my Wikipedia entry to see what they're saying about me. I have lots of papers, but I don't have that many awards. But th thank you for uh, conveying the fact that I, uh, the possibility that I did. Um, it's a great pleasure <clears throat> to be able to speak to you today. I think you can regard me as the light entertainment, largely because I know very little about language and even less about translation. Um, However, happily, I do know about uh, prediction. Um, so my talk will actually follow on very nicely from the previous talk, a, a different take on the predictive turn, um, namely uh, understanding the way the brain works as a prediction machine, as a, a, a statistical organ that tries to make sense of its data by predicting what will happen if I did that. In other words, um, an understanding of how we make sense of um, our sensorium. I'm going to um, overview the basic idea in terms of active inference um, and illustrate the principles using a toy example, exploration and tea maze, but then turn to an example which I hope you will find more interesting, um, namely the reading of text. So, I'm going to frame this talk in two halves. Um, the first is setting up the basic idea. And happily, we're going to be talking about surprisal and relative entropies and the like, which has already been uh, nicely set up by the previous speaker. I'm going to talk about that in terms of self-evidencing, um, leveraging or motivating the approach from the point of view of normative models of how we understand sentient behavior in general. Uh, with a specific viewpoint um, from the perspective of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And then we're going to take the basic ideas and apply them um, to message passing and belief updating in the brain, and then conclude with an illustrative example, which will be um, not, not about translation, but will speak to some of the fundamentals about how we scan visually text to make sense of the, um, the sensory uh, evidence at hand. So 
self-evidencing. What do I mean by self-evidencing? Well, the, the proposition here is that everything we do or think can be cast as a process of inference, and inference just is defined as changing beliefs or updating beliefs in order to maximize something called Bayesian model evidence. Um, so, but let me take you on a journey um, uh, to that denouement um, and demonstrate that this idea is implicit in many global accounts of sentient behavior, uh, active sensing, uh, choice and decision making. So what I've done is just summarize action and perception and everything else in between in terms of belief updating. Uh, so what do I mean by belief updating? Well, I'm imagining that the brain encodes, represents probability distributions or uh, conditional probabilistic beliefs or Bayesian beliefs about things. Uh, those things are latent or hidden states of the world out there, generating our sensory input, um, which we don't have direct access to, but we can use to build our beliefs about these, the latent states that are generating uh, observable outcomes uh, or observations here, um, conditioned upon uh, a model of how those states in the world caused the observable consequences O here. And exactly the same structure can be applied not just to sense making or perception, perceptual inference, but also to action selection, to choosing what to do, to deciding um, what to say next, um, to um, even our, um, our physiology in terms of engaging autonomic reflexes. And I'm casting that in terms of planning as inference, basically forming beliefs about those actions that I could possibly emit and then selecting the most likely action I infer myself uh, to, uh, to prosecute at any given time. And the idea is that both the beliefs about states of the world and the actions I'm pursuing are chosen simply to maximize model evidence, the, the likelihood of some observed data given a generative model of how those data were generated. So just to put this in other terms with which you might be more familiar, um, let's just look at this quantity, this evidence quantity here, and note that the um, that effectively, if I'm trying to maximize the, this quantity, I'm also going to be maximizing the log probability of some preferred outcome given me or given a, a, my model of the world. And I can construe that quantity as a potential, as a value function. And from that, I can read this as describing things like reinforcement learning, optimal control theory. And if I was an economist, it would be expected utility theory. And that's nice because the negative of this quantity is exactly the surprisal, or more simply surprise, that we heard about uh, in the previous lecture, the negative log probability, the unlikeliness of something actually occurring. Um, I'm going to refer to a free energy bound on this surprisal here, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, and in minimizing surprise, also known as self-information in information theory, we can read this equation as complying with or describing the principle of maximum mutual information or the Infomax principle, um, alternatively or equivalently, uh, the principles of maximum efficiency or minimum redundancy, as say articulated by Horace Barlow, uh, and indeed the free energy principle in the sense that we're going to optimize this bound upon surprisal. In turn, the average of the surprisal, if you like, the, uh, the ITRA of the previous talk, um, will be the entropy, the H. Um, so this is just the average surprisal. And if I'm trying to minimize my surprisal, I'm going to be minimizing the entropy, the dispersion, the disorder of my observed samples from the world. And of course, that's the holy grail of self-organization in physics, um, synergetics of the kind described by Herman Haken. And if I was a physiologist, it would just be a statement of homeostasis. It's just keeping my essential variables within bounds around a tight distribution with a very precise uh, statistic and a low entropy. 
And then the final interpretation, which is where we started, is if I was a statistician, this quantity, the probability of some observable data given a model, is just the evidence for that model. The higher the evidence, the higher the likelihood that, that these observations would uh, ensue given this model of how my observations were generated. And from that, we can read this, these equalities here as uh, a statement of the Bayesian brain hypothesis, um, Various comes in various flavors, such as notions of evidence accumulation uh, and predictive coding, and hence uh, this kind of predictive term. So let's just look a little bit more closely at this free energy um, approximation to or bound upon value or the negative uh, surprise or self-information. So what is it? Well, what I've done here is just write it out in a way um, that qualifies its name as a free energy. It's essentially um, a mixture of some um, implausibility of an outcome um, based upon a likelihood and um, some prior beliefs about the state of the world being like this and generating my data at this particular time and the uncertainty or the entropy of my beliefs themselves. And in maximizing um, this free energy here, I'm effectively just making a statement that our belief updating complies with James's maximum entropy principle under constraints. So what are the constraints? Well, we're going to be, um, uh, the constraints are provided by a generative model, a model which provides the likelihood that I would see these things if this was the state of the world, um, plus the log probability a priori that I believe that this, this state of the world um, is um, is likely or could occur. So a generative model is going to play a, a central role in everything um, that I do, um, I'm going to talk about because it provides the constraints under which we try to maximize our entropy with keeping our options open in terms of our belief states. Um, another way of writing out that expression for log uh, for the free energy um, will be more familiar for people in machine learning. Um, so it is trivially um, provable that this free energy um, provides what's called a lower bound on the log of the evidence, which means if I maximize F, I'm guaranteed to within a bound provided by this KL divergence or relative entropy um, here denoted by D, I'm guaranteed to maximize my log evidence and hence self-evidencing. And in, in, engineer, in engineering machine learning, this is known as an evidence lower bound acronym ELBO. It's exactly the same um, objective function that used in uh, high-end uh, deep learning, for example, variation autoencoders. Um, the nice thing though about having a generative model underneath this objective function is that you can explain how your data were generated. So in principle, we have, from the point of view of machine learning, an explainable kind of artificial intelligence with explicit generative models um, and uh, interpretable prior uh, assumptions. Um, what we will see later on, it also brings to the table another um, key advantage um, in terms of design optimality and compliance with the principles of optimal Bayesian design uh, that we'll see later, um, which in a sense underwrites a principled approach to data mining, foraging for the right kind of data that will um, maximally inform and update my beliefs in the most efficient way. And that's basically the essence of my talk. Um, there is another way of writing out this free energy bound and this is the, the, the way uh, that a statistician might understand what a good belief is, a belief that maximizes this evidence lower bound or free energy. And I've written it out here just by swapping around a couple of terms, um, just moving the terms around and um, enabling me to interpret the, um, the evidence bound as a mixture of accuracy and complexity. So I'm, I'm trying to maximize my accuracy, namely the expected log likelihood of any data given um, by beliefs about how those data were caused, whilst trying to minimize complexity. And this is gonna be quite a crucial concept 
and well, I know it is a crucial concept for, for some of you, and I would imagine um, quite intimately related to the different ways of understanding cognitive effort and load that we um, have heard described earlier in the session. So what is complexity in this setting? Statistically speaking, it's just the relative entropy or the, the difference between or divergence between my um, beliefs about the current state of the world, having seen some data, my posterior beliefs, um, relative to those beliefs before seeing the data, my prior beliefs. So quite literally, this scores the degree to which I have changed my mind from my prior beliefs to my posterior beliefs or beliefs a posteriori, having seen some data. And that could also be regarded as a, an information gain. Um, but of course, it does involve work in the sense you're moving um, from one belief state to another belief state. So it also scores or plays the role of a complexity cost. Um, and in minimizing complexity, I'm going to try and find the simplest explanation on the simplest model or hypothesis that best accounts for these data. So this is just describing Occam's principle, finding the simplest explanation. You see it emerge in many, many different uh, guises, particularly in machine learning in terms of factorization and weight sharing. Uh, it underwrites the efficiency um, in terms of efficient coding and the like. It also... Um, has important uh, roles to play in terms of structure learning, in terms of placing bounds on uh, rational um, uh, or maximum likelihood kinds of inference, um, and uh, suggests that you can find the right kind of priors that minimize the complexity. And of course, the right kind of priors that minimize complexity are those that are closest to your posterior beliefs, your beliefs having seen the world um, averaged over time. Practically speaking, if you're an engineer, for every movement um, of your prior belief to your posterior belief, every belief update costs a certain amount of energy. Uh, this is um, Landauer's principle, um, generalized to non-equilibrium systems by the Janinsky equality, which simply means if you're doing it in the right kind of way, you're going to do it not only the most efficiently in terms of statistics, but also in terms of thermodynamics, in terms of uh, brain metabolism, for example, your fMRI activation or excursions in terms of electrophysiological uh, activity, or did eye movements. So you're going to do it quickly and efficiently with a minimum expenditure of energy, simply because you're compelled to minimize the degree of belief updating um, that affords an accurate account or explanation for your sensorium. Um, so the rest of this talk is this basically taking that notion and saying, well, if that's the case, if these are the imperatives for sense making, and I am in charge of the data in, um, uh, that I'm going to use as the basis of my inference, then I should choose those actions that maximize free energy in the future, maximize my evidence bound in the future, which means I should maximize my expected accuracy and minimize my expected complexity. And the story is, if you just look at the maths, basically what that means is you've got two kinds of Bayes optimality in play. The first kind is choosing actions that maximize expected accuracy, and what we'll see is that this corresponds to um, the principles of optimal Bayesian experimental design, literally the principles that you would use when designing an experiment to get the right kind of data um, to minimize um, your, um, your uncertainty and resolve your uncertainty about your hypotheses. The expected complexity we will see corresponds to risk in um, uh, Bayesian decision theory um, meaning that minimizing expected complexity translates into making Bayes optimal decisions in the sense of uh, decision, uh, Bayesian decision theory. And the two together are just two aspects of or a decomposition of self-evidencing, namely maximizing the free energy um, that I expect consequent upon an action. So to make this slightly more intuitive, um, if I was there in person, I would be um, asking you a question now. Imagine you're an owl 
and that you're hungry. What are you going to do? And then I pick on somebody in the front row usually and ask them, what are you going to do? And they would generally correctly answer, well, I'm going to look for my food. I'm going to search for my food. Um, and when I've located my food, I will predate and sate my, uh, my appetite. That answer um, holds some deep truisms about the calculus that you might want to bring to bear to get a mechanics of um, belief updating and decision making and deciding what to do next so, you know, um, in terms of um, making life choices right through to where am I going to look next, which is the example we're going to conclude with. Um, just to illustrate the importance of that answer, um, I'm going to compare and contrast two different um, formalisms that you might want to use to understand the best choices, the best decisions, the best actions. One um, is um, going to rest upon the notion of a value function of states in the world, and the other one about beliefs uh, about those states. And I'm going to compare and contrast the two, but later on we're going to see that one is a special case of the other. So let's just start with um, the notion of value function. So if it was the case that I had a function of every state of the world out there that was scored in terms of its value, then I could just maximize, choose my actions U to maximize the value of the subsequent state if I prosecuted this action at the present time, and that would give me a state action policy. And for every state of the world, I would know exactly what to do, uh, and I would um, generate the correct answer. However, when you're searching for the food, then that searching means that you're reducing your uncertainty about where you think the prey is. But uncertainty is an attribute not of the state of the world. It's an attribute of your beliefs about states of the world. So that tells you immediately that the objective function that we're searching for is not a function or a value function of states of the world. It's a function of beliefs about states of the world. So I've written that down here formally in terms of choosing the actions that maximize a functional, which we'll see is the expected free energy, of beliefs about the states of the world that would ensue if I committed to this particular action. Furthermore, in terms of looking for food, then it matters whether I look and then eat or eat and then search. So in this more general formulation, we have the notion of a sequence of actions and a path or time integral of our um, goodness function, G, or expected free energy. Um, and I frame it like that because um, that means that we can describe this kind of approach, this, uh, which is basically the active inference approach or the self-evidencing approach, in terms of a principle of stationary action. So just like Hamilton's principle of station uh, of least action, for example, a variational principle in which you're trying to minimize the action or the cost of a path through some, in this instance, a belief, uh, a belief uh, space. And this can be contrasted with the equivalent principle for these uh, approaches here. Uh, based upon value functions, namely Bellman's optimality uh, principle. And you'd be familiar with the um, examples of both of these, I would imagine. So um, under Bellman's optimality principle, we have optimal control theory, dynamic programming, deep reinforcement learning, expected utility theory, and so on. Um, princi uh, variational principles of least action lead to things like the free energy principle and active inference. They also, because they're about beliefs, um, they accommodate artificial curiosity in robotics, this would be intrinsic motivation, doing sampling the world actively in the sense of active sensing in a way that is driven by the imperative to minimize your uncertainty or maximize your information gain. Um, and of course, that's just a description of a good scientist um, designing the right kinds of experiments to get the right kind of data, namely the principles of optimal Bayesian design. So that's the, the approach that we're going to um, explore 
and I repeat later on we'll see that the, this is a special case of this particular uh, approach when we resolve or remove all uncertainty from the table. Um, so let me just, uh, this is a, bit, a, a little bit heavy, it's, it's, it's the most um, mathematically burdened slide, but I'm showing it almost iconically because there's a beautiful symmetry between the different decompositions of variational free energy that we've just rehearsed in terms of machine learning and statistics and the expected free energy, which is uh, a way of scoring your policy or your, your plan pi here, your sequence of actions, your path into the future, um, uh, scoring the implicit um, belief updates as you e execute or commit to your <clears throat> commit to your plan. So all I've done here is um, rewritten out the expressions for, and this is the negative uh, free energy here in terms of complexity and accuracy, um, which just by swapping a couple of terms round, uh, we can rewrite as a, um, a, a bound or the KL divergence um, that uh, makes this a bound on the log evidence or an evidence lower bound. Um, and what I've done here is just written out the same thing, but now ex the expected value of this under the outcomes that I would get if I committed to this particular plan pi here. And what we see is that the complexity becomes risk, the expected accuracy becomes ambiguity, and the bound of the KL divergence and relative entropy, the kalmbach lieber divergence, all names the same thing, becomes the expected information gain, and the expected log evidence, or negative log evidence, becomes an expected cost or negative expected value. So let me just take you through that um, um, in terms, again, which you may have come across um, um, in um, computational neuroscience or uh, theoretical neurobiology. Let's, for, for the moment, ignore these prior preferences, this, um, this basic um, um, surprisal uh, that we talked about at the beginning, and just focus on this, um, these components here, the expected bound or the, uh, the uh, expected um, information gain. So what is, what is this? Well, it's just a KL divergence, an expected uh, difference between the beliefs about states of the world with and without observations that I would get if I committed to this plan. So this scores the, the information gain, the complexity, the expected complexity I would get if I did that. Um, this also can be rewritten very simply as a mutual information between the sensory consequences, uh, sorry, the observed consequences of the unobserved states of the world or causes that would um, ensue under a particular plan here. So uh, in the visual search literature, this is known as expected Bayesian surprise, uh, and this is the objective um, behind uh, principles of maximum efficiency and minimum redundancy and the like. Let's make things a little bit simpler. Let's assume that I can observe the world unambiguously, um, that there's no, if you like, sensory noise and I can see everything, in which case my observations essentially become my states and I can ignore the ambiguity. So what am I left with? Well, I'm left with this expected complexity or this risk. So what is this risk? Well, it's just the relative entropy or the divergence between beliefs about states of the world or their consequences, and my observe, the observed consequences in the future, should I commit to this policy or plan pi relative to my prior preferences, the kinds of outcomes that underwrite the value that we spoke about in the first, uh, in the first couple of slides. So this, this we want to minimize. So we're trying to minimize the divergence between what we anticipate will uh, happen if I do this, relative to what a priori I prefer to happen, those states that I find valuable or characteristic of me or my generative model. Um, and this in um, engineering is known as KL control, uh, in economics is known as risk sensitive control and um, underwrites a, um, um, a particular form of Bayesian decision theory. So finally, let me take the last kind of uncertainty off the table, um, namely the sort of 
um, the risk and what are we left with? Well, we're just left with the expected uh, cost or the negative expected value. So in maximizing my expected free energy, I'm going to maximize my expected value, my the log of my prior beliefs, my preferences, uh, which of course is just expected value. And this, of course, is just what people applying the Bellman optimality principle in um, reinforcement learning are trying to optimize. So we've got back now to the Bellman optimality principle, but in so doing, we've had to take all these sources of uncertainty that inflate the uncertainty of, uh, of beliefs off, off the table in order to get back to the special case uh, of the, uh, where the Bellman optimality principle would apply. So in summary, what, what have we said? Well, what we're saying is that there is a way of articulating and providing a, a calculus for sentient behavior which unpacks basically into um, Bayes optimality, but covering two dual aspects of what it means to be Bayes optimal. On the one hand, we want to make Bayes optimal decisions in relation to our prior preferences. And yet on the other hand, we want to act in a way which resolves our uncertainty and um, um, solicits the most informative uh, observations and data that enables us to do our belief updating so that we can make optimal decisions. So technically, that just means we can express our objective function, our goodness function, expected free energy here, um, written in terms of mutual information and expected value, as a mixture of expected value and expected information gain. Um, and so for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to sort of illustrate how you can use that mechanics, that Bayesian mechanics and active inference to understand um, message passing the brain and belief updating computational functional architectures. And then I'll finish with a, a brief illustration of, um, of, um, of uh, um, reading or sampling where to look next. Um, so I'm just going to take you through this quickly because uh, you know, this is probably of only of interest if you if you actually had to write down a message passing scheme or um, simulate a translator in silico. Um, but the point being, it can be done if you knew the generative model, the forward model that this uh, translator was actually using in order to make sense of her data and to decide what to look at. Um, and what to do and say. Um, and the, in my world, uh, so, well, in worlds in which you um, articulate a generative model into, uh, of um, discrete states of the world, um, then you generally write down your generative model in this graphical form. So for example, here, <clears throat> here are my observations at each point in time, um, moving from the left to the right here. These are generated through a likelihood mapping. This is a simple matrix um, or tensor, usually called A and parameterized by A. Um, and they're generated by latent or hidden states of the world uh, generating these outcomes. And then these states of the world change via probability transition matrices or operators here, usually generated by B, which are dependent upon what I'm doing, my policy or my plan. And my policy or plan depends upon um, the um, or is selected uh, in order to um, maximize my expected free energy or the goodness of that uh, of that policy G to be Bayes optimal and there's some initial prior beliefs about the initial state here and we can write down a, um, a Markov decision process or a partially observed Markov decision process that I've just described in this graphical form here here are the equations. You don't need to worry about this. This is a sufficient um, uh, description of this. So why have I introduced this? Well, the key point is, if you can write down your generative model in this graphical form, then there always exists something called a factor graph, a dual or a conjugate graph, where the nodes become vertices and the vertices become nodes. Um, why, why is that interesting? Well, the beautiful thing about these factor graphs is that they tell you exactly what messages have to be passed from one belief to another belief. Um, in other words, it tells you what kind of message passing is entailed by the inversion or the fitting of these generative models, this 
optimization process, this Bayesian mechanics that we've just um, committed to in terms of an explanation for sentient behavior. Um, and um, I won't go into any details, but um, so for example, we get messages about um, beliefs about states of the world uh, that come from both the, um, the sensory evidence here, but also um, the past prior beliefs about states of the world have inherited from past experience, but also uh, from the future. Um, so you're know, anticipating what will happen if I did that. Um, we also have a sort of pro, uh, a, a um, postdictive and a predictive aspect to this message passing. And one can now take these message passing graphs and um, in addition, um, the actual messages that are passed um, uh, can come from off the off the shelf software. There's nothing magical about them. Uh, I've just described some of them um, for this uh, for this generic form of Markov decision process here on the left hand side. Um, the key thing, or the really interesting thing about these messages, is that they look very very similar to the way that we simulate neuronal dynamics on uh, when we're simulating. Um, distributed processes uh, processing in the brain and um, so just remember you know all we're talking about is belief updating about two kinds of things with your know, states of the world out there generating our sensations and what we're going to do next our plans so um what i've done here is just rewritten these messages um in terms of uh um uh, the states that we don't know the hidden states of the world under a particular plan or policy here pi and the um the messages um or the updates um implicit uh, or entailed by belief updating or planning in terms of inferring the most likely policy i'm going to pursue which depends upon um, the expected free energy here i've also slipped in a precision term or a temperature uh, uh, term here which is interesting from the point of view of understanding the role of things like dopamine and neuromodulators in the brain and attention and the like. Um, the, the key point I just wanted to make here, again, I won't, don't want to labor it too much, but uh, just pick, notice that these uh, equations, which are off the shelf variational message passing uh, uh, equations for generic Markov decision processes look remarkably like belief update schemes in neuronal models, basically sort of nonlinear voltage current activation functions applied to mixtures of presynaptic inputs weighted by connection strengths here, or in this instance, a classic softmax response rule uh, that depends upon the expected free energy uh, and the precision usually thought of in terms of dopamine becomes something like a, a reward prediction error or a, uh, an expected free energy prediction error here. Um, learning, you can apply the same maths to the parameters here, the initial states, uh, and this looks almost identical, formally identical to associative learning with associative terms and decay terms here. And then we've spoken at length about the action selection, which is basically selecting the next action from the most likely plan or policy. And you can play all sorts of games in terms of associating these, um, this message passing on these factor graphs um, with different um, parts of the brain in terms of visual hierarchies and the hippocampus and the the role of the striatum in planning and action selection. Um, but let me now um, close with one of two examples. Um, the, the first is, a is the simplest example just to illustrate the nature of this kind of formulation of planned behavior or sentient behavior. Um, it's a very, it's, it, it is a trivial example, but it, it, it's deliberately simple just to sort of demystify the kinds of uh, the sorts of behavior that emerge when we choose plans to uh, to be Bayes optimal in the sense that I've described. Um, so the game is as follows, and this is a generative model that this um, little mouse uh, has in in its head um, and is using to make sense of its observations and choose what to do next. It can make two moves, and it's in a T maze. And it likes to get its reward in red here. It can either be in the left or the right upper arm. And it's got two moves. So it can take a chance and um, go to one or the other arm. And if it does so, it has to stay there for the remainder of the game. So um, it could take a chance and go to the right. And 50% of the time, it will be 
uh, correct and 50% of the time it will be wrong. So on average, it will uh, spend 50% of its time with its reward. However, this game has a twist. The twist is that it could choose to go and look at an instructional cure or um, a condition stimulus that tells it where the reward is. So it can use up the first move to get the instructional cue and then go and secure its reward um, because it now knows where it is. Now, from the point of view of reinforcement learning, both options will give you 50% on target. But from the point of view of active inference, you're going to resolve your uncertainty and um, indulge in that expected information gain if you choose the policy, which is the epistemic policy of going to um, the instructional queue to resolve the uncertainty and then uh, go and sit on your reward. Um, and this is a generative model. It's very, very simple. You just write down your know, movements in terms of uh, um, move, uh, where the, the mouse can move to and sequences and hidden states is the reward on the right or the left and where am I? Um, and preferences in terms of the prior preferences. I like to be with my reward and, uh, um, and um, uh, very neutral about um, looking at my instructional cue. So you can write this down very, very simply in terms of these A and B operators here, and then just iterate those equations to create a, a little in silico subject or mouse uh, and look at its behavior. So what does it do? Well, I'm showing the behavior here in terms of whether the reward is on the right or the left. Um, and the policies, um, do I move, do I stay here and move down? Do I go over there and stay there? Do I move down here and then go over here? Or do I go down there and go over there? So it's got a number of different sequences, two moves uh, it can entertain. And the mouse um, chooses policy number nine, which unsurprisingly is basically um, disclosing, finding out where the food is, searching for the food, and then going and um, predating or sitting uh, with its reward. Um, and these uh, two graphs here um, just reflect the learning of whether the reward is on the right or the left um, and some characterizations in terms of performance and outcomes. What we did here though, is repeat these trials 32 times, but then played a trick on the mouse. Instead of randomly placing the reward on the right or the left, we left the reward on the left-hand side. And what happens is, um, as time goes on, the mouse learns that the reward is always on this side, which means that the amount of uncertainty, the information gain, the epistemic affordance, the epistemic value uh, of going here first gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, whereas the expected value or negative expected cost that underwrites the Bayesian decision theoretic part of it gets uh, doesn't change. So at some point, the epistemic affordance or value falls below the expected utility of going straight to the reward. And we see this um, deterministic switch from explorative behavior to exploitative behavior, when effectively the, the a uh, mouse has learned that the reward is always on the same side so that it has hoovered up, it has resolved all its uncertainty, and now it can um, indulge in this exploited behavior and go and sit with its reward for two moves. Um, illustrating this natural progression from exploratory behavior in a, um, an uncertain context, um, through to exploitative behavior when there is no more uncertainty to resolve. Um, just to, um, just practically speaking, one of the beauties of having um, an in silico, a digital twin of an experimental animal um, at hand is you can start to now do all sorts of experiments in on the digital animal of the kind that you would do in the laboratory and reproduce a lot of interesting phenomena. So for example, you can look at the belief updating in terms of those variational, that variational message passing, in this instance, cast as a gradient descent on variational uh, free energy. Um, and you can sort of track representations of various hidden states and options 
uh, in, uh, you know, and label them in terms of the chosen option and the unchosen option um, in the way that people do look when uh, trying to characterize um, unit responses in uh, invasive animal studies. Um, you can you, you can plot the activity of various representations of latent states. Where am I as a function of where I am in physical space? And you can reproduce place cell activity. Um, you can even, um, although not shown here, reproduce um, mismatch negativity effects by comparing uh, responses to various cues or moves when the environment is uncertain at the beginning uh, of the um, a succession of trials and uh, when the um, environment is, uh, you are very much more familiar with the environment and associate these with oddballs and standards and look at the uh, the differences in the uh, the evoked responses, simulated evoked responses. But what I want to do is just finish now with, with um, another example using exactly the same technology and exactly the same ideas, and in fact, exactly the same code, uh, <clears throat> which is more pertinent, uh, at least in a, a very elemental way, to uh, some of the problems that, 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 that you tackle. Um, to do that, though, um, I'm going to have to move from um, this, this elemental, generic, graphical model of a lived world that comprises discrete states. Uh, here's the graphical model and the corresponding um, normal style or Fourney style factor graph um, to um, a, a deep model. And deep in this instance has a particular meaning um, in the sense that as we go deeper into the model where causes cause causes that cause causes that cause causes that cause outcomes, we get a separation of temporal scales. So the higher levels unfold more slowly in time than the lower levels. So I've um, depicted that here in terms of the graphical model unfolding over time. So here's what we had last time. But now I put another Markov decision process on top of the first one, where this, this one unfolds more slowly and generates the initial state for the decision process or the graphical model at the lower level. So you can imagine this generating a sequence of contexts, the context being something that is invariant during a series of time steps at the lower level. And then that context unfolds and then the context changes. And then um, um, we have a, a faster, shorter trajectory at the lower level generating the actual outcomes. So this would be uh, this would be a, a particular form of deep generative model, um, uh, where deep just refers to uh, you know, having a hierarchical depth, but crucially with a separation of temporal timescales to, to separate in the genesis of outcomes the context from the content, but also um, putting transitions and probabilities and contingencies and beliefs underneath the succession of contexts uh, that themselves can also, with a higher level, um, be contextualized. Um, the graphical model here just nicely illustrates what that, what that kind of generative model means for belief updating in a brain. Um, and, uh, and specifically, um, you know, um, the, the role of the downward messages from the deep level to the, uh, the level nearer the sensory input where effectively these descending messages provide empirical priors or constraints on the unfolding dynamics and belief updating at the lower level, because you've inferred the context in which you're making sense of the data that's coming in much more quickly at the lower level. At the same time, the evidence due to belief and evidence accumulation at the lower level is then passed up as a message to change your mind about which context you're operating in. So you're inferring the context on the basis of uh, influence at the lower level that is informed by the empirical priors or constraints um, delivered by uh, the influence at the, uh, at the higher level. Um, so to illustrate how that might work in the context of deep inference and reading, um, I've built a, a very simple generative model here. Um, and it's a generative model of um, iconographic reading, um, where the um, 
letters correspond to these little icons, null, some a pile of seeds, uh, a bird and a cat. Um, and the words are deployed on the quadrants of a um, um, of a uh, a word uh, a word here, so that these two letters mean flee. If there's a cat near the bird, fly away. If there's some seeds near uh, the bird, uh, it means feed. And if there's nothing there, then we just wait for something to happen. Um, so this is completely arbitrary. I'm just uh, arranging some. Uh, iconic uh, iconographic letters into little words. Um, and this would be an appropriate generative model if I wanted to um, generate or predict um, the letters that I would see if I was looking at a particular word. So just rephrasing that, if I wanted to build a generative model, I would have to uh, write down the latent states or the causes of what I actually see. Um, and what do I see or what do I feel? Well, what I actually see um, is what I'm looking at. It's the letter at hand and also where am I looking at, you know, quadrant one, two, three and four. But to generate this, I have to know what word I am looking at and where I am looking. So if it's a flea and I'm in position one, then I'm going to see a bird. So I have to know this in order to generate these outcomes. Conversely, if I want to infer and do my sense making, I have to use these outcomes to infer which word or what is the word I'm looking at, and indeed, um, where am I looking? Uh, I've slipped in an interesting uh, um, twist here, just flipping horizontally the words to uh, emulate uh, a font change. Um, so that would be perfectly fine for sort of, uh, you know, an elemental model of letter reading. But what about reading proper of a more natural sort? Well, it, what I can do now is put another generative model on top of this, another Markov decision process to make it into a deep generative model. So in a, if I wanted to generate what word I was looking at, I'd have to know what sentence I was actually reading and which word I was actually looking at in that sentence, so whether it's the first or the fourth word here. And with these states, I can now generate from the higher level of the, of the generative model, the, the sentence, the context in which I'm currently operating. Um, I know the sentence and I know where, where, how far through the sentence I am, therefore I know the word, if I know the word, then, uh, and I know where I'm looking, I can generate what I'm actually seeing here. So this is the generative model that um, we used to simulate what would happen in terms of where I'm going to look next, either in terms of scanning around a word or jumping to the next, uh, uh, scanning the letters of a particular word or jumping to the next, um, the next um, word in a sentence, all the time trying to um, be Bayes optimal, complying with the free energy principle or performing active inference, in this instance, there were no preferences. So we're just looking at this epistemic affordance expected information again. So we're just really simulating um, the principles of optimal Bayesian design. But in this instance, in terms of where am I going to look next if I have to make sense of this stream of visual inputs that are letters. And this is what happens when you integrate those, uh, those equations that I showed you earlier on and um, have that biological, neurobiological plausibility. And so what I'm showing at the top here are the various words in this flea way to feed sentence here. Um, and this is the scan path um, taken by the synthetic um, agent. And uh, here are the, if you like, the beliefs, the expectations uh, unfolding during this evidence accumulation, active evidence accumulation, as we're moving from one um, sampling, one um, letter in one uh, word or the next word. And the interesting thing, and what we can see here, for example, um, is a resolution of uncertainty as more evidence is accumulated. So, for example, the first, um, the first Saccard sees a cat here, so the synthetic subject knows immediately, she knows immediately, and this has to be the word flea, and therefore can jump to the next word, because there's no epistemic value, there's no epistemic affordance in staying on this word because she knows what the word is. So she can jump straight to 
uh, the next word, but sees nothing. So a bit ambiguous, and then uh, double checks to make sure it's a, um, um, a weight by looking um, at the lower quadrant, confirms it's a weight, and then jumps to the next word. Again, a little bit ambiguous. It could be a feed or a um, three word. Uh, she resolves our uncertainty by looking not, now not at the next word, but the next letter in that word, sees its seed, and then can um, finally um, um, jump to the final word and build her beliefs about the sentence at hand. Um, so I'm going to show exactly the same um, data or simulation um, in a format that may, um, may be useful if you were an electrophysiologist. So for example, up here, what I'm showing is the, the neuronal representation of expectations about words and sentences as a function of time during the uh, expression of the saccadic uh, sample, um, this scan path here. So at the top, we have beliefs. It could be sentence one through to sentence six. It could be word um, one through to word three here. Um, and these beliefs change qu more quickly because they're at the lower level. So we first of all have to see the flea word uh, and then move to uh, the weight word and then uh, move uh, to the feed. Um, beliefs about the sentence are accumulated more slowly, resolve themselves more slowly because they're only the last word disambiguates between the first and the fourth sentence here, namely, is it wait or flee? And of course, once the last word has been um, accumulated or assimilated, um, then the correct inference is made that we were looking at this sentence and we're currently looking at the word wait. And if I interpret these uh, representations as neuronal firing, they look very, very similar to raster plots of um, animals uh, involved in pre saccadic or when people record neuronal activity during pre saccadic delay period activity in the prefrontal cortex. And if I simply filter these data um, in frequencies that are typically applied in EEG research in electrophysiology, um, then they look remarkably similar to evoked potentials. Um, that show characteristic um, sort of separation in terms of faster responses at lower levels of, say, in this is the visual hierarchy, and slower responses at this level in terms of evoked responses at higher levels, in this instance empirically from monkey V2 and area TE. This example coming from periscopic field potentials during uh, active vision. So I present that example just as um, um, an illustration of the potential utility of having not just a, um, a, a model of translation afforded by the predictive turn, but actually the process of translation in a brain that is itself uh, doing prediction, enabling you not just to... Um, um, predict the behavior, but also um, predict the belief states and their electrophysiological correlates. And I would imagine, um, just listening to the presentations, um, the, you know, also being able to predict the kind of eye movements and the timing of the eye movements um, using these sort of digital twins or virtual subjects and seeing what changes in the beliefs or the precision of the beliefs will be necessary to best account for the empirical responses, at least during reading. Uh, I, I think uh, at this stage to actually get these uh, synthetic subjects to translate would be a bit of a tall order. Uh, so with that, I will close with um, um, the words of Helmut Helmholtz, who, as always, summarizes um, these ideas much more compactly. Um, each movement we make by which we alter the appearance of objects should be thought of as an experiment designed to test whether we have understood correctly the invariant relations of the phenomena before us, that is their existence in definite spatial relations. And with that, it just remains for me to thank those people whose ideas I've been talking about, and of course to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed.
Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. It, I, I guess it gives us much uh, food for thought and uh, shows to very new ways to look into our data and to analyze it. So I'm uh, very curious to follow this up a, a little bit and to dig into this a little bit deeper eventually over many years when I've digested uh, this whole thing a little bit better. So is there any questions? Any questions? Online perhaps? Yeah, thank you also very much for uh, mentioning at the end that you th it seemed to me that you think it's applicable for translation too, right? So they are uh, free energy principle. So you, you are uh, positive that we can use this to uh, also um, formalize translation processes, right? So yeah. Yeah. I, I think that would be that, that would be very challenging, but a great thing if it was uh, if you could accomplish it. I mean, not only in terms of um, having a synthetic subject, you could do um, experiments on that you couldn't do in real subjects, but also adjusting the uh, the parameters of the generative model to make the synthetic subject match observed empirical behavior. Uh, but also you would actually have a Bayes optimal translation toolkit, uh, which would effectively be an explainable um, uh, machine learning version of, uh, of, of, of what translators do. So I'm not saying it'd be easy, but, but in principle, you know, if you could do it, it would be absolutely marvelous. Yeah. So this is actually um, exactly the topic of this conference, because we are on a machine translation conference here. And uh, the topic of machine translation is, of course, an automatic agent who produces uh, translation. But this agent uh, machine translation has usually not eyes to uh, look at texts. So, that's, uh, so they only look at, uh, um, well, I don't know, maybe they look at the context too, and you can consider this to be eyes too. So there is some attention in neural networks, uh, which, uh, which is uh, passed and uh, analyzed. Um, yeah, so maybe one can consider this to be uh, artificial agents uh, uh, for uh, translation agents. Anyway, is there uh, any more question or comment? Okay, so I was uh, then I have a, um, one more question, perhaps no so um, you were uh, saying this higher order um, model to where you have different contexts, and I was uh, wondering um, the context maybe are not always very obvious, so there is a, a kinds of two problems there right, so you need to kind of uh, separate the contexts in order to find the, uh, the, uh, the, the policies. For each context, you have maybe a different policy, right? And uh, so there is uh, two kinds of um, intertwined problems to figure out what is the policy and to figure out the context and the boundaries between different contexts. Um, does that make sense, the, the question? And do we have maybe any idea how one, or is there any, um, ways to address those things? Yeah, no, that makes entire sense. I, I mean, <clears throat> I think that is the essence of this notion of deep inference or inference and, under um, deep um, generative models where you've got the separation of temporal scale. So if you think about it, the only thing that discriminates the contextual state from the content is time. So the context is temporally invariant for a longer period than uh, things unfold within that context. So you have to put this into um, a generative model, a state space model that has things unfolding um, in time, um, which um, you know, uh, now speaks to the boundaries. When does the context change? So if you apply this technology to speech recognition, of course, then, then that becomes particularly um, uh, uh, important or prescient in terms of putting sort of phonemic boundaries in order uh, that, you know, in this instance, you know, is is the context listening to this word or that word, and what's the evidence for those two um, 
those two words, which has an enormous implication in terms of mm. uh, putting boundaries on on the phonemes. So again, it's, you know, the, the linearization problem um, in auditory speech perception um, um, you know, is exactly this problem of, uh, of deep inference or deep hierarchical inference that is explicitly uh, a time dependent process. You know, so you, you were mentioning before about attention being deployed to select in, in conventional machine learning, say transformers, for example. Mm. Um, and of course, the whole thing about a transformer, uh, that a variation autoencoder or a convolution neural net doesn't have, is that it, it has that temporal aspect by looking at the past, by caching time series. But you know, strictly speaking, what you really want is a generative model of a narrative of a process that, that is unfolding in time in order to know what the most efficient um, data to attend to or where to look next. So in principle, if you could build a machine and solve the very problems that you're talking about by having the right kind of generative model, um, then you would find the most efficient way of solving this sort of uh, dual problem where the context um, determines the, the content, but the content, of course, um, you know, needs uh, needs to be inferred before you can infer the context. It is exactly that circular causality that was implicit in that um, bidirectional message passing between sort of deep and more shallow uh, parts of these deep generative models. So this means these um, two problems could be solved in a joint manner. So. Uh, uh, you find solutions for both at the same time. Yeah, I, I would I would submit that, that mathematically that's the only way you can you, you can do it because the conditional dependencies from a mathematical point of view um, mean you can't solve one uh, without solving the other. You, ha you have to solve it jointly through this distributed message passing with a hierarchical generative model. Yes, absolutely. OK. Yeah, thank you very much. So if there is uh, no more questions on the chat, there is no question. And here people are understood everything, it seems to me, <laughs> or also not. OK, then, uh, thank you very much. And give uh, an, uh, thank you to Karl again. Okay. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. And bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye. Thank you very Good night. much. Good night in England. Indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.